All right, so with that, I am going to uh, turn it over to uh, James Pennick to talk about bare metal. He's gonna be our moderator. Please get involved, ask him hard questions and uh, put him on the spot. My, my good friend, James Pennick, take the mic, sir. All right, <clears throat> thanks y'all. Good morning, afternoon and evening. Um, let's go ahead and kick off. Uh, I can go ahead and share the ether pad. Um, Aaron, are you, could you put up that poll? I can, one second. All right, thanks. We love polls. Should be up. Excellent. I did not go ahead and make sure Zoom could. Ah, actually, is someone else able to share the Etherpad? Apparently, I have to quit Zoom and rejoin for it to be able to share my screen. We've got it, James. No worries. <laughs> yeah, we've been we've been running into a few of these, so we're we're ready. All right. Thank you. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'll keep the poll up for a little bit and we'll start talking through a few of these use cases and then we'll uh, we'll come back and discuss the poll results. Um, so starting out with the use cases, um, what are your folks use cases for bare metal? I see we have at least a few people that are doing cloud infrastructure for provisioning um, and then uh, bare metal instances directly for cl clients and then uh, traditional data center management. So for the cloud infrastructure provisioning, are there uh, folks here that want, uh, want to talk a little bit about what they're using it for? Um, I can start by sort of teeing off what we do. Uh, we do have quite a lot of bare metal instances, and we have everything from sort of more traditional data center workloads, uh, which certainly make up the bulk of our fleet because we, we do have, we've been around a couple of decades, and so we do have quite a lot of hardware still in those areas but we've also been building out new cloud infrastructure. So we've got a little bit of everything um, from building, uh, we use Nova with Ironic to provision uh, uh, hundred, hundred and something thousand bare metal machines. Um, a lot of which, like I said, are the traditional workloads, but we also use it to manage our OpenStack VM installations, uh, which, which, and then our, both things are available directly for our users to consume. Plus, we have a more modern OpenStack infrastructure that we've been deploying recently. It's our new cloud native thing. So what are you all using it for? Does anyone uh, want to share what they're using? Yeah, Prakash here. Yeah, we do use uh, in bare metal specifically invocation through Ionic using metal cube from Airship. That's the one use case which is uh, really interesting. And uh, the possibility of using bare metal either through uh, metal cube, it has again two modules. One is bare metal operator, the other one is ionic interface. So either you can use the ionic or you can replace with any other uh, bare metal uh, invocation. Like Starling X does something different. So. Uh, these are the possibilities and definitely it's a, a good one, specifically since it, of course, deals with a bit of a container besides the bare metal and uh, very interesting. These two projects in Open Intra have been really uh, instrumental in leveraging uh, the bare metal. Thanks. Hmm. That was interesting. So it's uh, you, you a little. It sounds like you actually use a few different things, but that's uh, the the interesting one there, especially was that you're using Metal Cube. With, uh, that's uh, Kubernetes with uh, with Ironic, right? That's right. One second. Did I mute myself? Sorry. And then uh, some folks out there, it looks like what you're doing is you're actually provisioning bare metal instances on behalf of clients. So you have users and consumers and you're provisioning bare metal on, their, on behalf of them. Does anyone want to talk about what they're using, how they're consuming that? So, so this, this is Beth. I could talk about um, our, our uh, bare metal at the edge. Um, which is of course primarily driven by the fact that um, you want to cram as you want to minimize the resources that you use for the underlying infrastructure. So bare metal is kind of the obvious one of the ways to <laughs> reduce that footprint. 
Um, so we're using uh, something, it's actually a commercial product that is built. It was, um, it's OpenStack and then I'm not actually sure, they're not using Ironic. I'm not sure what they're using uh, underlying to, uh, to orchestrate it and, um, and build, build the, um, the uh, shim, I call it a mm -hmm. shim, the, the underlying hypervisor. Awesome. So. Okay, cool. Yes, yeah, so the edge use cases, those are those are really interesting since I think you know, edge is um, very much top of mind for a lot of deployers right now. Right. So then your team uh, does a lot of work, you, you uh, or part of what you're doing is you're deploying hard, bare metal onto the edge and then you're uh, using that to deploy like containerized or virtualized workloads. Right. Yeah, they're virtualized right now because uh, we'd love to do containerized, but um, that doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, that's but the main reason that we're we're doing it is because we want to reduce the so footprint as much as possible. Um, but yes, the workloads themselves are not bare metal. They're on top of the infrastructure. But we ran into an issue, um, I guess, last year. Uh, you know, we we were going to upgrade, and uh, because there, we had added some significant functionality into the into the underlying infrastructure, and uh, we, it was at, and I've talked about it. I think I talked about it uh, on Monday. There was a significant problem in that we had. It took us several hours to. Um, to rebuild each one of the boxes. So what it, sh it should have been, you know, you download the new image and you, you know, reboot and you're done. But that wasn't unfortunately the way it had to be done. So um, we had to download the image and then rebuild the box, you know, and which took, you know, that meant that we had to, uh, to, to put in a maintenance window of like three or four hours, which, is tough in an edge environment um, right. because it means that you're not completely uh, connected to that environment during that time. So there's a risk that we lose connectivity um, and have right. to send somebody out to take care of it. So this is a model where you're going to image machine on the edge and there's no local cache for the image. So it has to pull that image down over the network yeah. from a site that could be hundreds or thousands of miles away and so just the latency pulling down those hun presumably hundreds of megabytes or even some gigabytes. Yeah, actually, a couple of the images are gig. They're like a gig or two. Okay. So, yeah. That's actually, that's a problem we've seen as well with some of our stuff with, um, and so we've been working on some different ways of addressing that. Um, one of the things we're looking into uh, well, that we've actually done with some of our bare metal stuff is in our edge sites, uh, we actually can pixie boot over the network a local machine that does a secure remote boot. And that machine then becomes a local image repository, but it's all storing the images entirely in RAM. And then um, other machines then in that edge site, they can pixie boot off that first machine. Um, the interesting thing with that design is we we in for our model it's different than like a, a um, the larger telco you know we're we're doing like content caching and we just we're focused entirely on providing accelerated like um, user experiences for for basically web content but we need to do it in such a way that we're ensuring that no user data is being put at risk and so for us the acceptable risk is that. All these machines are basically diskless, and if they reboot, then we have to wait for that first machine to reboot over the network, and then all the others can reboot. So we accept that all the machines in that particular version of an edge site, we might just say, okay, well, they're down for hours now in case something happens. <clears throat> and this is done so that if somebody were to go into this edge site and like steal the hardware, they couldn't take any user data off that or compromise their security. But that's much different than a, like a telco use case where you actually need to be providing like a communication service that's persistent. 
Right. So, so there's, there's the rub, right? You're providing a network service. You need to upgrade the network service and you have to take the network service down to upgrade it. <laughs> yeah. What I like about what you brought up there is <clears throat> it shows the, uh, the, the very large spectrum of use cases for bare metal, right? It's one of those things that's like, uh, it's like public utilities. You know, a lot of people don't appreciate the water company or the power company until it goes out. And then it's just like a fundamental part of the universe has disappeared. And so they're just so used to bare, bare metal being a thing that is handled for them that they don't even notice it. Um, and that, but it really shows that there are a, you know, for all this focus on really interesting and far more interesting like workload management systems from VMs, containers and functions that the, a lot of people do turn their nose up at what is really the foundation of it all, bare metal. And so I think that's really interesting. Um, let's uh, kind of moving on in the doc here. Uh, folks, uh, where do you see your use cases evolving over time? Are you seeing, you know, we've talked about the edge and far edge. Is there anyone else out there that like recently you've been seeing uh, newer use cases that you certainly didn't anticipate? And uh, feel free to unmute and join in if you'd like. Yeah, one, I don't know whether it's new, but I do see use uh, in Onan for the 5G physical uh, bare metal being used for the uh, development of 5G functions. So when you do some kind of a uh, distributed uh, or disaggregating the functions, the tendency is to use bare metal. Uh, maybe with containers, without containers, but that's the way at least current development is going on in open source community, other open source communities. Interesting. Okay. <clears throat> and certainly, so sounds like um, the, like containers and maybe about the abstraction from bare metal so that your use cases are, does that mean that maybe some of your your bare metal use cases are simplifying over time, and that the idea and that the more complex layers for for the things you were demanding of bare metal are moving into the things like uh, containers, or do you feel that? Sorry, go ahead. So I don't know. Maybe that is because uh, when you deal with the lower layers, especially layer two, layer one, uh, then the composing the stack. Uh, disaggregated uh, makes it easier to deal with networking uh, if you are in the bare metal. But and that's the current state. Prakash, could you could you talk about that a little bit more? Because I um so as I'm thinking about it, bare metal brings up the you know that the perpetual cycle of um, disaggregated hardware with you know with uh, with integrated hardware. And um, so you're more dependent upon the hardware. So, yeah, that's true. So, uh, initial all uh, 5G functions are currently being viewed as uh, depending on the uh, networking, the storage, the compute. And so they tend to work towards simplicity. And that could be because it is in the uh, early stages. Uh, now that is my interpretation, but it could be maybe because of more to do with the performance, more being able to directly deal with bare metal, especially acceleration. And uh, so because VM and containers both do not have all the features, feature parity. And uh, that could be one reason, but I'm, I'm still struggling because if you look at uh, XPUs, I mean the GPUs, the uh, FPGAs, so those drivers are not really available for the situation where they uh, would like to get it. And therefore I believe the uh, need for doing that is uh, more so in the newer uh, uh, functions which are related to radio, which are related to um, what you call the edge and uh, that's that's what I understand, but still I may be wrong off target. Essentially, I'm trying to still understand why why that. 
So largely my perception is that it's occurring because people want or need the performance. Uh, they feel that containers are an easier way to move forward. The cost of that is actually that your environment's networking is no longer abstracted. It's no longer something that uh, you don't really have to worry about. It's something you have to absolutely focus on and it becomes a huge configuration bottleneck in terms of how do I get from point A to point Z with a deployment and environment uh, with a network that very few probably even understand. And I mean, I mean like the physical wiring of the infrastructure down at the server level. Yeah, that's actually, I should point, so there's the, there's, that's the trade-off is like, is that you've got the, um, you've got the trade-off between the abstraction and the advantages of abstraction, but also then the perceived like performance delta. So like bare metal, you certainly have higher performance, but you also then lose some of the higher order functions and some of the interesting tie-ins you can get with infrastructure, which actually wants me to take it to one of the next things here. Um, uh, some I'm seeing some really good stuff coming in this teal color here. Um, for, for the folks writing that, uh, I see infrastructure as code for bare metal and VMs. I really like this one, so Terraform for both. Um, I actually really like that because that's something that um, we're finding is important for us too, is the ability to have some kind of cloud orchestration for bare metal and VM. And basically, uh, in our environment, something I, I've worked towards for a long time is to be able to present uh, our infrastructure as uh, really that bare metal is just and VMs are just like different size flavors from each other. And that's one of the reasons we use uh, Nova as the entry point for our bare metal is for our users, we're trying to train them that that a VM and a bare metal, they're really just two different sizes of a thing. Because for us, we have kind of an addiction to bare metal and we're trying to move people off of that and move our users into things like VMs containers. Um, oh, John, um, hey, do you want to yeah, talk a little bit? No. Yeah, I can do. I, I'm plus one everything you said, really. Um, I guess we're seeing a lot of, so we work a lot with, um, you know, HPC centers that have got massive Slurm cluster and want to replicate the same thing, but without all the manual crazy. So it's kind of, it, and to actually start getting to the point where they can carve off subsections of that for people to do like simple thing, simple things that you can do in infrastructure code just for, well, let's have two clusters, one that's half the size and dedicated to customer X. Like once you take the, the hit of actually fully automating your stuff, then you can kind of start doing those things. But yeah, the, the VM bare metal distinction hopefully kind of goes away. Um, although I'm agreeing with everyone saying this, there's a performance versus abstraction trade off. Um, certainly one of the things for me that always keeps coming up is live migration. Uh, and that's kind of an application thing in many ways. So like at some point you need to decide whether you get to choose when you flash the firmware on your host independently of what the VMs are doing on top or whether people actually know it's a physical machine and they take the hit that you one day you'll come and tell them that it's time for them to get off that. And that applies <laughs> and that applies triple in the edge. <laughs> yeah, no, that's very true. Um, so one yeah, I guess it's, it's yeah. yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's just that, yeah, it's that performance abstraction trade-off, I guess. Yeah, abstractions, uh, when you talk about, we do find the API level abstraction uh, for physical, because you need to discover the various drivers. Uh, and that there is one, one API by Intel, which is uh, trying to, uh, what do you call, uh, harmonize across uh, with uh, NVIDIA. GPUs on one side and uh, uh, other FPGAs and uh, so they call it XPU and then one API directly talks to the uh, devices, discovers and uh, that's something which I'm seeing as one of the uh, evolutions and that could uh, take some impact on the bare metal in near future. Like uh, GPU CUDA is the way which NVIDIA had been doing 
and so they have brought something called uh, sickle for the uh, open seal which is a concurrent processing so that you can do multiple like if you want to provision hundreds and thousands then and that could be a, a multi threaded uh, option and that's uh, evolving and uh, we do uh, see in the data centers that how fast can i create a vm or how fast i can get a Redfish, Redfish API to boot a bare metal, and eventually uh, this is going to be for the uh, more on the uh, larger scale deployment. But it can also be used for the edge because then you can uh, do it uh, remotely. Plus, the early days, if you remember, uh, when VMware started early 2000ish, we used to do P2V and V2P. But I don't know whether we can do equivalent of P2C and C2P in this new uh, environment. But that those are some of the ideas which will pop up in the market. I don't see that history doesn't repeat itself, but we will so, look forward to this. Yeah, I mean, I, I've noticed recently using like, um, like for one example, the CentOS cloud images, like they out the box support like InfiniBand hardware these days to a surprising degree. So we've kind of seen a bit of convergence in the fact that, um, so if you think about SRV and PCI pass-through, we've kind of broken some of those abstractions in the VM world anyway. So you actually need the drivers in there to actually access those raw GPUs that we're passing in. So I think all you say is true, but I think we've got the same problem in the VM world as well. Um, in the VM world. <laughs> um, I also need to pick more shirts that cause aliasing artifacts. The perverse want to do that. Anyway, um, I, th I think a lot of yeah. differences end up coming from the fact that an application ends up getting built a certain way and has certain operational needs to fit inside an environment. So I think where we start seeing the need for I need to use a container instead of I need to use a VM is largely the style of orchestration and the style of application architecture combined with that my entire process to meet get to that point All right and uh, i think a good strong uh, like a good sort of strong example of um of that could actually be like um uh, we've got folks in my team they're working on containerizing even how we deploy OpenStack and ironic and our environmental management system but for our vm stuff even though we want to containerize the, most of the control plane um uh, for example, the hypervisor itself is not something that right now, that workload is not something that we're going to containerize just because of the, the complications between where you run QEMU versus not. I was going to say, we certainly, so for Collar, um, so we tend to use a lot of KOV with Collar Ansible, and that does do that um, containerization of QMU and libvirt and OVS. Oh. Um, so that works. It's more a case of the, the fact that the containers are probably more privileged than you'd want, but it gives you the advantage of having the images that you push out on top of the base image, which is nice. So you have That's to have actually, a matching kernel, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so that it's is, well worth looking at really the color images. They've tackled that. Um, so what we generally do is we use Bifrost to do all the hypervisors in the control plane. So that's standalone ironic. Um, so that's what KOB deals with. It does that. So that's all containerized on that bare metal. And it, it, it also has, kob has got a nice way of which it can then start enrolling the Ironic nodes into the overcloud Ironic for you as well. So you get that split between controllers, com, uh, hypervisors, and um, Ironic bare metal nodes. So you've got, um, it's worked through all of that problematicness. Excellent. Um, so it's definitely worth a look there. Hey, J-Roll, are you on? Yeah. Okay. If, okay, good. Let's steal what John Garbutt's idea. Let's do that too. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Awesome. I talk to Always steal John's ideas. <laughs> I'm stealing everyone else's, so you know it's all uh, it's all recycling. Big. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, excellent. Um, so, kind of moving on to one of the next things. Uh, so, folks, that in terms of like the the next evolution of these use cases do you feel you have all the tools you need um are there things you think that are are missing or um 
that you have? So do you have anyone have anything really interesting that they're building they'd like to share? Sure, I, I, I like to see some discussion on uh, um, bare metal with respect to switches. Because bare metal doesn't mean that necessarily it is all servers, right? Mm -hmm. So you do have white box implementations uh, of switches, which are also coded as bare metal. So how uh, does anybody come across uh, or has anybody used uh, bare metal switches and uh, uh, loaded the operating system and uh, are using in field any of the operators like yeah, Dino? Yes, on several fronts actually. Um, so we've made great use of that with Ironix Nova and Neutron integration. It actually works really well. So you can go through the provisioning network into the into the tenant network back into a cleaning network that's all separate. Um, we've used a combination of NGS networking generic switch so that's quite good at sshing in like over like a paramico kind of thing also using a little bit of ansible networking which i guess um uh, julia you can probably talk to you much more than me i see that's interesting it, it's, it's it's pretty effective um and it's been useful for you know for those cases i'm saying like you you're dealing with all the vlans and all that mapping that's now inside the openstack abstraction you know, as it should be to get that similarity between bare metals and VM. Um, I haven't dug into things like the um, like bridging between VXLAN and VLANs and all that kind of. Um, uh, are, are there any specific agents you are using there for the switch configuration? And... It, it, yeah, networking generic switch and um, Ansible networking, slightly depending on the which switch vendor supported and where. Mm -hmm. There are some scale limits, but. Um, they've all got their solutions around that. So some switches are only less have you to have some of the old Dell switches, for example, only let you have five SSH connections at once because, you know, they've got a poor little processor there that only doesn't, only wants to do that. Um, but as long as you, you can actually use NGS has got like a locking system. It can use, um, I guess it's etcd or whatever to support, I guess, but it has the locking system to make sure that you can only do five concurrent connections at once across the three controllers and all that kind of jazz. Um, so it's been pretty effective, although, you know, it is another point of failure, mm -hmm. you know, to be fair, like you can, it, there are ways in which you can get into funny situations, but just with anything, just hardware is always since to be, you know, it's hardware. <laughs> anything about the inventory in that respect, bare metal inventory, if you do switches versus uh, servers, anybody has come across any, like what we see by inventory. So what happens is you do discovery, right? Once you do discovery, where do you uh, manage to keep those uh, configurations? Is it something like, uh, like in- yeah. Uh, yeah, you have to keep them in controllers. Yeah, you have to keep, yeah, it has to be centralized management. Okay, so like yeah. you have an app called ENDI, active and available inventory where they put everything. Yeah. So similarly in Kubernetes, we have HCDB and here we obviously put in MySQL, I believe in OpenStack, but still could be any other. Yeah, it could be any, so, doesn't matter. We have done with, with quite a few customers, we're trying to do like relatively zero touch provisioning. So you, so we actually you tend to use, so the KAV I was talking about, we tend to discover the hypervisors using the Bifrost inside there using inspection. So mm -hmm. all those machines, once you power them up on the right network, will do inspection and give all the LLDP yeah. information back to the central ironic and you can move from there. But John, how, how many, how many you want? Yeah, I was going to say, we, we, I remember having a discussion about this because um, uh, at the edge, we were, we were talking about doing a bring your own hardware type solution for our customers. And uh, we quickly realized <laughs> that it was very fraught <laughs> because absolutely you have to do discovery, but you also immediately have, potentially hundreds of accommodations. So, uh, so when, when we've been doing the large build outs with customers, we've been basically working with ensuring that the vendor ships you a compatible configuration for doing this kind of thing. So if when you take your server out the box, it's doing DHCP on its out of band management interface, for example, 
that gives you a lot of benefits rather than taking it out of the box and them all having the damn same IP for DHCP, oh, well, for, yeah. the, for the out-of-band management. That's unfortunate. Um, um, I think there's a fun story in our blog about how you can get around that. <laughs> but that was only a few, that was a, like two racks rather than anything large scale, because right. so, heck, that's hard. John, do you, uh, do you do in-band or out-of-band discovery uh, and introspection? Uh, generally inbound. Okay, so then you obviously need to have the you know, minimal setup in order to be able to do it. You so that connect. means that whatever yeah. the hardware you bring in is already at least partially pre-set up for you to be able to do it. It's not just the DHCP IP address. What are you, what are you saying is um, that the compat a compatible SKU is basically orders delivered to the yeah. site, it's connected, it boots, and that's where the pow that power of that in-band in band discovery exists is where it doesn't it doesn't you don't need, need any to know anything about the machine otherwise because it'll get populated and stored and then whatever human or software process you want can take that data from there and then do the next needful steps exactly that there's um there's a point where so you... I've had these conversations a few times and it depends what you fix in, in time, right? Often uh, when we get equipment sent from vendors, you can actually ask them for a, a you know, an, a list of what they've sent you in terms of MAC addresses, potentially for the out of band management networks. So if you've got, and you know that you've got so many ports populated on your switch, physically speaking, so if you're like fully populating your switches, what, what I'm getting to here is if you do zero touch management, um, you don't want to have half of your rack turned on, right? And not notice that the other half hasn't done something. So you do need a list of what you expect to see versus what you, um, what you've actually discovered, right? You're, you're actually treading in some waters here that are really interesting for me because these are, these are something that, um, we also rely on getting, we buy just whole, uh, whenever possible, just whole cabs of hardware from our mm. cabinets of hardware from our vendors. Um, and then we do still get quite a lot of gear loose that we then uh, assemble into our own cabinets. Um, and then, yeah, when we get the hardware from vendors, we actually, we, we do get a list of Mac addresses with them. And one of the things we found what's interesting, and I'm curious if anyone else has ever run into this, is when you're buying enough hardware, when you're, when you're buying like hundreds of thousands of machines, um, we we will get somewhere that they'll come from the vendor where actually multiple machines will have been accidentally burned in with the same Mac address. Um, or where the MAC address is actually incorrect in the list they provide us. And that can send us on a merry chase through the, you know, trying to sort these things out. And it certainly makes the um, in-band inspection a little more difficult, but that's something we're trying to work towards is this, my sort of like grand vision, at least for bare metal, one of the big pieces of it, I call wired up and walk away where we want to get to the point where, you know, a cabinet can come into the data center and we just trundle it out onto the floor drop the legs, plug it in, and then our side ops personnel can just walk away and then have the, um, you know, the discovery system, discover the nodes, boot them, inspect them, compare them against the purchase order. And then, and only then, if something is wrong, call the, our side ops personnel back. That way our side ops people can really focus on just only dealing with um, more interesting problems, right? Only, only deal with things that are broken. Um, we're, we're still a long ways off from all of that. We're, we're working towards it, but I am curious if anyone has uh, started to build any of that automation and actually have that fully automated end to end life cycle. I've known, I've spoken to a couple of people who have achieved that sort of end to end fully automated life cycle. The, there, I guess there's two problems. One, uh, it, there's getting your vendor on board and actually get make, driving them to always delivering a consistent inventory and list and not having those snafus with uh, flashing max. And then there's also the entire, getting the entire tool chain in place. So you have that in your data center and you can have that. And usually these projects take a long time. So unless there's a good strong core response, there's nothing, sometimes they end up getting killed because, oh, we can just send people onto the data center floor and do it. And it, it's not the right answer. Uh, but it happens, unfortunately. Right. So we're working at the moment with a project with Cambridge to try and commission the new half of their supercomputer. So I will blog, we'll make sure we blog about how we do that. 
or how it doesn't work. <laughs> awesome. Um, I would call out the vendor, but they're on the call. So, so you know who so it is. That... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ouch. So speaking of, of vendors, I'm actually um, part of, so that I think kind of ties into something else. So um, in terms of, you know, building these systems to get hardware into the data center, one of the problems we've seen is that, you know, you know, every, our, we, we have a team that's always evaluating different hardware configurations. They evaluate how our application consumers are building their stuff and trying to find what are the right mixes of hardware to satisfy all these things. While at the same time, trying to then limit that to a reduced number of different hardware platforms. Say like, oh, well, we need five or we need 10 hardware configurations this quarter to satisfy all the use cases for, for organic growth this quarter. Um, but we also buy each of those configurations is satisfied by a number of different vendors. So this means that we have, you know, at a minimum 40 new flavors every quarter, but practically speaking, we have many thousands of flavors. So different vendors, different uh, uh, chassis types, different uh, drivers. And I'm wondering how, how many other folks out there struggle with things like uh, IPMI working consistently across their fleets. Like we're not on Redfish, we're still using IPMI. Um, like, are we the only ones out there that will see situations where we we can build a machine, deploy it on our data center floor, and it's for certain vendors, by the way, most vendors have at least some hardware that does this. It's not just one, um, but we can deploy this thing on the data center floor, and within five minutes to five months some of those machines, the IPMI BMC interface will stop working. And then someone has to go and physically reboot the machine to get the BMC back. Um, has anyone else experienced that? Uh, yeah, that's that's a pretty common and at an edge, of course, it's even worse, right? I was gonna say plus one. I think <laughs> we've been working with a lot of customers that have gone to the point of they've got um, smart PDUs so that you've got a backup. <laughs> so you don't actually have to go to the rack. I was worried about that because yeah yeah we used to use the smart pdus but they're actually really expensive that whole infrastructure from smart pdus and many of them only have an rs-232 interface so then you need rs-232 like serial concentrators um and then which is even more cost uh and the ones that are ethernet enabled still is very expensive yeah. i think okay. yeah they were using ethernet enabled ones but yeah it, it's a yeah. choice right it's got a yeah, cost but yeah it is no matter what it's a very expensive solution and and if you think about it, ipmi is really old technology at this point right it's what 25 years old <laughs> it, i guess what i have what i have found is that it, there's very few servers where it doesn't work at all it, it's been flaky but it's and you, and you do kind of have enough usually to get ironic to work <laughs> i guess it's what we found um but did you have the same problem as ironic also john you know in terms of uh, ironic stop responding after some period of time <laughs> I, I always remember there's the odd node that comes across that does something funky um and i wouldn't say it's any particular vendor i'd say it's just generally that's something that happens occasionally with Ironic. Um, and to be fair, actually, Ironic's reporting and logging has been, I think, reasonable enough to see that that's what's going on. Yeah, but you mentioned that you had a problem specifically with IPMI protocols. I was wondering if you go to the Redfish protocol, you have the similar problem. Of course, Ironic oh, right. being in the middle, it can you know, mitigate it and uh, you know take appropriate action so the end user does not see it. But that's slightly different angle. I see what you mean. Um, I, I don't think any of the problems have been persistent, if you see what I mean. It's just that every so often, it, okay. out of our management's gone a bit funky. Um, I, I wouldn't say there was, I wouldn't say we've done it at enough scale to see that there's a pattern apart from what James was saying, really, that we've seen stuff do strange things. But it may be deep down, I'm a software person, and I expected the hardware to do strange things. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably my fault. <laughs> I think that's basically the best advice I would give any like burgeoning bare metal operator is 
to expect that the hardware is going to do some weird things. And, and admittedly, I don't have any experience with Redfish just because with the, the downside of the running large like sort of what it's sort of hyperscale infrastructure is that uh, you start having to solve for the lesser common denominator. And so for us right now, like, you know, to Beth's earlier point, Redfish or IPMI is, is pretty old technology. You know, and for us, we really only got everything switched over predominantly switched over to IPMI in 2000, uh, 2011. That was really when we started hit, hit hit a large double digit percentage of our fleet was on IPMI. So it just takes a long time. What was it before? Uh, it, it was actually smart PDUs everywhere. Oh, okay. Well, that's funny. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. Like, the irony is not lost on us. <laughs> We were like, all right, we'll get rid of these old things. And now it's like, ah, I wish we still had those. That would be that would be great. It, it, uh, it is ironic that the hardware, I mean, there's a whole lot of hardware, you know, BIOS and IPMI that is, you know, it's so old and it's almost impossible to replace. Because every time we come up with something new, it's like, oh my God, all the, the <laughs> all this uh, all this other, you know, all this installed base is still out there that needs to be supported. Yeah. No, how actually, would, go ahead. How about the uh, use of IPv6 mm -hmm. with link local so you don't have to do all this cloud in it and uh, just do virtual media or something? Combination there. That's an interesting mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Is I, I anyone using it like, like with Slack or? I, I So I, there's multiple questions there. So we should probably tease these apart. Uh, it sounded like Prakash was asking about using link local with virtual media. And one of the problems that might be there is you actually can't cross the router. But you have to be on the same physical broadcast domain. Oh, right. So that, yeah, that's an interesting point. Because um, for a lot of folks, like, 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 so Prakash, like, is this something that you're starting to use in your environment, or you're looking? No, towards I'm, I'm just thinking. I'm thinking aloud. Why that uh, we started oh, good old times, Kickstart, Jumpstart, and so many things. And one is at the level where we need to reach where we are at the bias level. The second is OS level. So bias level, if it can cover the OS level together using virtual media, uh, that could be an option because you don't, whenever you do a cloud in it, you have to look forward to getting something from somewhere, right? It could be image, it could be something. So if the media itself is part of the firmware, which used to be the older way, right? We used to have everything within the BIOS itself or within the firmware. So are you, are yeah. you suggesting uh, basically attach virtual media that is the operating system? Yeah, virtual media, if it becomes the default part of the system board. Okay, I can at least speak from Ironic's perspective and that was partially what the intention of the storage interface. Uh, but we've also seen more adoption and more use cases for virtual media for more ad hoc operations or supporting deployment in general. So it's, the, I guess the thing, uh, going back to Penix's comment was, or about, uh, you have to support the least common denominator. In many cases, people are want to use the 10 year old piece of hardware for their, their lab and testing, and the same techniques are not going to work. They're going to run into firmware issues. V6 isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. All sorts of things that we would want today if I was building a brand new data center mm -hmm. with bare metal cloud. And it, so it's going to, it's always going to be an experience. And you have to have identified your least common denominator and what path you can take. Somehow, well, I, I feel that the industry standard bodies are not. Uh, really address that. Even HC shied away from defining anything on the physical side of it. And it, it, uh, I, I would, I do agree with some of that. I think part of it is also um, you get in situations where a lot of uh, new hardware feature development is probably driven by customer contracts. So if a customer wants mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z special feature, they're probably paying for that. And so everyone get, might end up getting that special flavor of the special thing, and it might still not be generally applicable or really completely usable right. for other things outside of the special case that they have. Yeah, I think there is scope for improvement, a lot of improvement, especially even at the 
mother board level or the board level whether it's out of band or in band definitely uh, redesign is called for at this stage with all the changes in the hardware and the firmware capabilities basically yeah and i think that would be an interesting thing to work with maybe the user story group to see if maybe we can get like a kind of council of different vendor providers together and see if there's some opportunity there um and i do we are i just realized we're running low on time which is regrettable because i feel like i could easily talk about this for at least another hour with you all because i've been really enjoying this um i did want to spend a couple a couple of our remaining minutes and talk about life cycle management um so something that we're looking towards is uh really covering kind of the, the the cradle to grave life cycle for all of our hardware everything from when it comes into the data center and we actually talked a little bit about that sort of wire it up and walk away but other things that are really interesting to me are once we reach our projected end of life uh, point for a hardware platform usually the our, our models usually show that about three to five years somewhere in there is is about when um when it's time to start to retire a machine um and that has to do with just in terms of like ongoing maintenance costs start to ramp up after a point as well as in some cases uh, with bare metal the hard the power consumption of that node is so much higher than newer machines that are coming out for a comparative for a comparable performance point that actually makes sense to get rid of the old hardware resell it and go buy something new um and so for this, I was wondering, has anyone actually done any automation with the full end-to-end -end life cycle management? So where, you know, when the machine comes in, you run some kind of burn-in process, it then gets turned over and consumed by users for a long period of time. And then at some point, um, and this is probably most relevant for the folks here using uh, OpenStack with Nova and Ironic, um, when the consumer deletes their instance through Ironic or Nova, um, you know, have you done any automation so that once that instance is deleted, it actually gets flagged as, oh, you know what, this is an old machine. Don't actually return this to available pool of hardware. This is something we're not doing right now. Uh, we we, so, we do, so, so oh, please. I was gonna say, you probably wanna upgrade Ironic then. Um, we have the last half of that already in Ironic and the wonderful folks at CERN have been talking about uh, posting some burn-in stuff. Uh, to help facilitate ensuring that the machine is in a good, healthy state before it gets consumed. That's awesome, Ruby. Let's uh, let's if you're yeah. on here, let's upgrade. Ironic. Yeah, I think I don't know if Arne is online, but um, certainly there are gradual filling in in all the gaps, um, getting the burn in done, but also looking at things like a benchmarking cycle to try and pick up any uh, bad parts um, that are underperforming. And then equally at the other end, a retirement cycle with clean and a special state for that. I think that's in Asuri, if I remember rightly, but Arne could confirm or Bill Miro for definite. It, right. So, it is so, so basically what we sorry. Go ahead. So basically what we like when we started with Ironic, we basically started like almost everyone, I guess, with the provisioning part. And then we work working our way to the two ends, which is basically towards like delivery and auto discovery. So what we have is like we have uh, benchmarking already next up is burning and we're leveraging the ironic framework and actually in order to do this like uh, cpu burn and memory burn and disk burn -in and so on and then the next step after this will be which is like in time coming before um the auto discovery but we haven't done this yet and on the other hand on the other side we have introduced um, a retirement um flag actually into ironic um i think that comes with uh oh, sorry, where you can actually flag nodes as being retired and they won't be available anymore. Um, and what we also do is like when we have servers that are not used by or consumed by services anymore, so they're too risky to run like serious services on. Um, with Ironic, we can relatively easily hand them over to the batch team, which just runs um, like uh, batch services on them that can, like if the machine breaks or not, it's not that critical. But yes, it, yes, but we, we're trying to use like Ironic basically from the start to the end and we are still like, trying to push and replace all the tools that we have um, built over the past couple of years. So Arnie, quick question on the burn-in bit. Is there a specific ironic feature you're doing for that? 
so basically what we do is, is basically very similar to what we do for for benchmarking we we reusing the um the cleaning framework so we introduce cleaning steps so we have a cleaning step that's called benchmark and basically what it does it uh, uh launches the the nodes downloads a container and the container basically um, knows where to get its configuration from and then basically does the benchmarking and it also the container also knows where to send the the benchmarking results to so basically it gets like an elastic search endpoint and stuffs all the all the benchmarking has done uh, into this elastic search endpoint and we will just do something very similar for burning um, the burning step will be however will be split into multiple smaller things so you can actually like when you have the cpu burning and it breaks what you want is that the node basically freezes and that well it freezes it it stops at the situation stays on so that people can log in and actually check rather than okay it failed we move on with something else and you have no idea uh, what actually happened or even worse switch off and you lose the state so so burning will be also like um steps and cleaning but individual steps but basically we're leveraging um or misusing the, the cleaning framework for this Oh, I don't, that's, that sounds like a good use. So you, yeah, you get a clean failed for the right for the burn-in step, basically. Exactly, and then like the, the team that's actually like doing all the so the the procurement team, which is actually uh, in the installation team that does all the installation, they can actually then see okay which nodes are in clean failed and why, and they uh, then go in and check these these specific nodes. Beforehand, it was like we had our own handcrafted image that the nodes were actually booting into, and then they were scanning basically log files. To like see if there's something wrong, um, uh, so some notes that peek out, and and similarly what we have introduced or, or pushed upstream lately is some um, introspection rules. So like very early on, even before we do the burn in, so if if you come like from uh, from the end, you, you do benchmarking burn in, and then at the beginning you do like introspection. Uh, we have introduced introspection rules which have a scope, so you can basically per delivery define okay. How many CPU cores does this delivery have? How many disks? How much RAM? What do I expect? And then inspection is consuming these um, these rules that can be scoped per delivery, and then flags the node where something is missing. That's that's really excellent. That actually sounds a lot like exactly some of the things that I want us to be doing. So, Aaron, we are going to uh, gleefully poach uh, as much as that is possible, and. Actually, on that note, um, I, uh, Thierry provided that there's actually a, a blog post that uh, CERN put up from 2018 about uh, at least some of the high-level points of the, the hardware burn-in. And then there's also, uh, you all did a talk at the Shanghai Summit, which Tim just linked as well in the chat. Um, I know we are running low on time. I'm personally going to go look at those because those are really interesting to me. And so I encourage other folks that are interested in that to take a look as well. Um, we are about five minutes over, uh, and again, I wish I had another hour for us to keep talking about this. I have, I, I, I have I, although I've arrived with the hook, I've also arrived with some good news for everybody, which is uh, that uh, in three weeks, we have an entire three-day event on hardware automation, in which James um, and Julia and many of the folks participating here are actually on the programming committee. I happen to know there's a whole section on hardware lifecycle management. So, um, I'll, I'll let you get in the last word, but uh, we are uh, going to take a break in just a second. But uh, it is awesome that we our next event is all about hardware automation, and it's three days. It's openstack.org slash opendev. You can register for it. Um, so there'll be a lot of conversations in between online. We can all connect. And definitely, you want to uh, follow James and Arnie and, and Julia and everybody on Twitter. Um, Arnie's always sharing incredible stats about CERN's use of bare metal and how they're doing it. So good conversation on Twitter too, but we got that event coming up in three weeks, hardware automation um, to dive into all this stuff in more detail. So James, do you have any, any last words of wisdom here for us? Uh, last words are really just gratitude. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining and sharing with us. I look forward to stealing as many of your ideas as possible <laughs> and uh, putting them into our infrastructure. Um, I really appreciate all the collaboration. Awesome. Great. Well, I think uh, we're going to take a short break. 